How Human Nature Gave Birth to Religion When something appears in every known society, as religion does, the question of whether it is in the genes naturally arises. Did religion confer such benefits on our distant ancestors that genes favoring it spread by natural selection? There are scientists who believe the answer is yes. Enough of them, in fact, to give rise to headlines like this one in a Canadian newspaper, Search Continues for God Gene. Expect to see that headline again, for the search is unlikely to reach a successful conclusion. And that isn't just because, obviously, no single gene could undergird something as complex as religion. Things don't look good even for the more nuanced version of the God gene idea. That a whole bunch of genes were preserved by natural selection because they inclined people toward religion. Oddly, this verdict that religion isn't in any straightforward sense in the genes emerges from evolutionary psychology, a field that has been known to emphasize genetic influences on thought and emotion. Though some evolutionary psychologists think religion is a direct product of natural selection, many, and probably most, don't. This doesn't mean religion isn't in any sense natural, and it doesn't mean religion isn't in some sense in the genes. Everything people do is in some sense in the genes. Try doing something without using any genes. What's more, we can trace religion to specific parts of human nature that are emphatically in the genes. It's just that those parts of human nature seem to have evolved for some reason other than to sustain religion. The American psychologist William James, in his 1902 classic, The Varieties of Religious Experience, captured the basic idea without referring to evolution. There is religious fear, religious love, religious awe, religious joy, and so forth. But religious love is only man's natural emotion of love directed to a religious object. Religious fear is only the ordinary fear of commerce, so to speak, the common quaking of the human breast insofar as the notion of divine retribution may arouse it. Religious awe is the same organic thrill which we feel in a forest at twilight or in a mountain gorge, only this time it comes over us at the thought of our supernatural relations. If you want to put James's basic point in the language of evolutionary biology, you have to drag in the concept of an adaptation. An adaptation is a trait whose underlying genes spread through the gene pool by virtue of their giving rise to that trait. Love, for example, seems to be an adaptation. Love of offspring, by inspiring nurturance of those offspring, can help genes get into future generations. As a result, genes underlying parental love seem to have spread by virtue of their conduciveness to love. You can similarly make arguments that awe and joy and fear, the other sentiments James cites, were in themselves adaptations. Fearing a big aggressive animal, or a big aggressive human being, could save your skin, and thus save the genes underlying the fear. But that doesn't mean religion is an adaptation, even though religion may involve love, awe, joy, and fear, and thus involve the genes underlying these things. To shift back into less technical terminology, you might say that we were designed by natural selection to feel love and awe and joy and fear, so long as you understand that designed is a metaphor Natural selection isn't like a human designer who consciously envisions the end product and then realizes it, but is rather a blind, dumb process of trial and error. But to say that these emotions are a product of design isn't to say that when they're activated by religion, they're working as designed. Similarly, humans were designed by natural selection to be able to run and were also designed to feel competitive spirit but that doesn't mean they were designed to participate in track meets. Religion, like track, doesn't seem to be an adaptation. Both seem to be what the paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould called a spandrel, a phenomenon supported by genes that had become part of the species by doing something other than supporting that phenomenon. A spandrel is an incidental byproduct of the organic design process, whereas an adaptation is a direct product. Religion seems to be a spandrel. And yet, you might say, religion does have the hallmarks of design. 
It is a complex, integrated system that seems to serve specific functions. For example, religions almost always handle some key rites of passage, getting married, getting buried, and so on, whose ritualized handling is probably good for the society. How do you explain the coherence and functionality of religion without appealing to a designer, or at least a designer? You don't. But biological evolution isn't the only great designer at work on this planet. There is also cultural evolution, the selective transmission of memes, beliefs, habits, rituals, songs, technologies, theories, and so forth from person to person. And one criterion that shapes cultural evolution is social utility. Memes that are conducive to smooth functioning at the group level often have an advantage over memes that aren't. Cultural evolution is what gave us modern corporations, modern government, and modern religion. For that matter, it gave us non-modern religion. Whenever we look at a primitive religion, we are looking at a religion that has been evolving culturally for a long time. Though observed hunter-gatherer religions give clues about what the average religion was like 12,000 years ago, before the invention of agriculture, none of them much resembles religion in its literally primitive phase. The time, whenever that was, when religious beliefs and practices emerged. Rather, what are called primitive religions are bodies of belief and practice that have been evolving culturally over tens or even hundreds of millennia. Generation after generation, human minds have been accepting some beliefs, rejecting others, shaping and reshaping religion along the way. So, to explain the existence of primitive religion, or for that matter, any other kind of religion, we have to first understand what kinds of beliefs and practices the human mind is amenable to. What kinds of information does the mind naturally filter out, and what kinds naturally penetrate it? Before religion appeared and started evolving by cultural evolution, how had genetic evolution shaped the environment in which it would evolve, that is, the human brain? To put the question another way, what kinds of beliefs was the human mind designed by natural selection to harbor? For starters, not true ones. At least, not true ones per se. To the extent that accurate perception and comprehension of the world helped humanity's ancestors get genes into the next generation, then of course mental accuracy would be favored by natural selection. And often, mental accuracy is good for the survival and transmission of the genes. That's why we have excellent equipment for depth perception, for picking up human voices against background noise, and so on. Still, in situations where accurate perception and judgment impede survival and reproduction, you would expect natural selection to militate against accuracy. Truth and Consequences in 1974, San Francisco newspaper heiress Patty Hearst was kidnapped by a radical group called the Symbionese Liberation Army, whose goals included death to the fascist insect that preys upon the life of the people. After being kept in a closet for a while, she came to identify with her new peer group. Before long, she was enthusiastically helping them generate income, at one point brandishing a machine gun during a bank robbery. When left alone with an opportunity to escape, she didn't take it. She later described the experience. I had virtually no free will until I was separated from them for about two weeks. And then it suddenly, you know, slowly began to dawn that they just weren't there anymore. <laughs>